Have you ever discovered a story and thought, this was made for me? Like its characters were speaking directly to the particular circumstances of your life. Sometimes art unifies you with the artist's mind so intimately that it can make you feel transparent. But what if the connection got interrupted somewhere between art and artist? What if the story really was speaking to you? That's exactly what happened to young Jonah Whitman when his favorite childhood show offered to kill to do something ghastly. Angel Hair is a story told over 17 tapes, a short educational video game, and a mysterious third source that I don't think many people know about yet. You and I will join Jonah as he digs into a rabbit hole of lost media and discovers a host of uncomfortable memories along the way. And, as you'll start to see, there's something very, very wrong with this show. There's always something wrong. Sometimes a product feels like it was made just for you because there's a powerful divine entity living inside of it. But other times, it's because that product is for everyone. Just like today's sponsor, Aura. Aura is the all-in-one personal security platform that helps you to stay safe on an increasingly predatory internet. They provide you with powerful tools such as password management, automatic security updates, a VPN, identity theft insurance, and so much more. The most striking feature of the entire package to me is Aura's automated opt-out requests. Basically, there are tons of shady businesses online that are profiting off your information. If you tell them to stop, they legally have to but they get around this by making the opt-out process extremely convoluted. By the time you've told one data broker to knock it off, two more have already popped up to take their place. Now, I was supposed to tell you about how my own information had been leaked online. I was supposed to show you screenshots of all the data that's available right now to scammers and spam callers. A few months ago, I could have done all that, but here's the deal. Before Aura ever approached me about sponsoring this video, I had already signed up and started paying for it myself. Seriously, they offered me a free trial and I literally just had to turn it down because I already have an account. Before that, it was pretty horrific. I mean, my name, address, medical information, it was all online, but get this, I literally can't show you any of that because Aura scrubbed it all from the internet. The product works so well, I can't even properly advertise it. The best I can do is show you how many vendors were buying and selling my information and tell you that before I signed up for Aura, I would get at least two to three spam calls a day. And since I signed up, I haven't gotten one. I really can't say anything more for Aura than it's already said for itself. You can keep yourself protected with a free two week trial using my link, aura.com forward slash chromudgeon in the description. Thanks so much to Aura for keeping me and my family safe online and for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to Jonah's experiences over on his channel. In September of 2022, Jonah Whitman was browsing the aisles of a thrift store when he stumbled upon a memory from his childhood, a single VHS tape containing the entirety of a series called Angel Hair. Angel Hair was a piece of Christian children's programming created in the mid-90s that had a modest run of six episodes. More importantly than that, however, was the impact that it had on Jonah as a child. Immediately upon finding the tape, Jonah was struck with a sense of supreme comfort. The show had helped him to feel safe and secure as a child, that much was certain. But something else was hiding inside the tape, something obscured or perhaps forgotten. Nonetheless, he snatched up the tape, raced home, and prepared to relive a small slice of childhood. At least, that's what Jonah expected. In reality, so much about the tape was different than he remembered. Some things were the same. Francis the Badger was there, calling up into the clouds like always. But when the angel descended from the heavens above to aid Francis in his plight, she was totally different than Jonah remembered. What was going on? Had he simply forgotten how the show was? I mean, that would make sense, considering how long it had been. Jonah became determined to prove that something was wrong, and he began digging through boxes full of memories. Eventually, he dug up what were, to him, the original copies, tapes that he and his mother had recorded from live broadcasts of the series. Immediately, Jonah was vindicated by the footage on the tapes. Both tapes start off exactly the same. Francis calls to the angel in the clouds, and she descends after a moment. She greets the little guy, then notices Francis's new friend, that friend being you, the viewer. It seems like this first episode of the series must have been on the topic of making friends, because the angel starts to instruct Francis on how to introduce himself to new people. 
Meeting new people doesn't have to be scary. Just introduce yourself and ask them to do the same. <clears throat> Hello there. My name is Angel Gabby. Angel Gabby. A play on Angel Gabriel, the angel in the Bible who's best known for announcing to Mary that she'll be the mother of Jesus. Gabby then asks for your name in a Dora the Explorer sort of interaction that's common in children's shows like this one. Then she waits for you to give a response. She then... <sighs> Look, we both know it isn't this simple, so let's just skip to it. Jonah switches things over to his recorded copy, and it's pretty clear that this show, it's not about you. Francis starts the conversation in the same way. Gabby, I have a new friend here, but I'm afraid because I never know what to say. In the original copy, Gabby had comforted Francis by telling him how not to be afraid. But here, she simply tells him, fear should never control you. The biggest deviation by far, however, is with the introduction itself. This time, it's not Angel Gabby. It's Angel Gabriel, straight up. Then, she directly addresses Jonah as Jonah. Hello there. My name is Angel Gabriel. What's yours? It's wonderful to meet you, Jonah. I hope I can be a good friend to you. Jonah explains that he originally assumed that he shared a name with the main character of the show, but that's kind of an odd coincidence, isn't it? Later in the episode, Gabby teaches us that sharing is a great way to make new friends, and she asks us to think of a book or toy that's special to us. Then she kind of just stares lifelessly into the camera while the craft background scrolls by. That said, I think I'd rather her do that than what she does in Jonah's recording. She asks the same question, but during the pause, we can very clearly see her eyes trace something moving off towards the left of the screen, then back in front of the television. That's a great book, she says. She's actually watching Jonah through the screen, speaking to him. Jonah considers the possibility that he's going crazy, but it's all there on the tapes, and there are still five more episodes to go. I also have to say, if any of this sounds interesting to you, I highly recommend that you go check out Jonah's experiences over on the East Patch YouTube channel. I mean, clearly this dude could use all the support he can get. I'll link to a playlist of the entire series in the description so that you can find it easily. Now, if Christian Rabbit Dora started speaking to me directly and using my real name, I'd be throwing the whole TV out. But that's not what Jonah decides to do. Instead, he goes looking for answers, digging into the history of the series to try to figure out what logical explanation there could be for the discrepancies between the tapes. He checks versions from other regions, alternative releases, everything that he can possibly research through the internet, but turns out very little. One detail that would become important later is the distributor, Keith Publishing. KP was in the business of redistributing old shows after they would buy the rights from the original creators, and it seems like they got their hands on Angel Hair after purchasing it from a company called Wreath of Life. The only issue is, Wreath of Life doesn't actually seem to exist. Whether that's because it's just too old or because of an intentional cover-up, it's impossible to say. I looked into it myself as well. But neither Jonah or I were able to find anything concrete. Well, aside from one piece of evidence that I can't share with you yet. Just know that there's something weird with this company. Now then, the rest of this tape includes clips from another episode of Angel Hair. This episode has to do with finding strength to persevere in life's most difficult moments. Quite the topic for a kid's show to tackle. Francis doesn't know how to face the struggles of each day, but Gabby assures him that faith and hope are what he needs. They won't make him physically strong but they can bolster his mind to take on new challenges. Gabby's tone in the recorded copy is totally different. Rather than laughing with Francis, the angel completely ignores the little badger, even talking over him. Right now, she has important information to share with Jonah. The sun is warm sometimes, Jonah, but you shouldn't forget the moments when it burns you. Oh, thank Gabby. How can I have the strength to face the day? All the rain has got me shivery and sad. You will need strength to be resilient during times of comfort, and fortitude to be brave during times of heat. If Gabriel was really speaking to young Jonah through these tapes, why is she so stern? What did Jonah face in his youth that would warrant speaking to a child this way? And with that in mind, why did Jonah find the show to be so... comforting? I mean, I don't know about you, but if I had seen this as a child, I would have found it to be really confusing or 
maybe even frightening. It was always scary when adults would suddenly become very serious. Jonah must have felt differently about Gabby. And I mean, the lessons that Gabriel teaches to Jonah are never too different from the original themes of each episode. They're just tweaked a bit. The thrift store episode is all about anxiety, regulating your emotions, optimism, and strength. The recorded copy parallels this in some ways. Gabby promises Jonah that she'll teach him to be strong so that he'll never feel despair, so that he can face his enemy. It's intense to say the least, but it's still basically teaching the same lessons as the original episode. Right? We feel safest where we go to sleep. Do you want your room to feel safe? First, let me show you how you can be stronger than your enemy. Like David's little pebble against Goliath, this little chair is going to be stronger than anyone who comes to your door. If we put it backwards like this, it will be like your own lock and key. Look at that! It's so strong! Now let's get in the closet. The dark can be scary, but it can also be peaceful. Instead of letting the sounds and darkness make you fearful, look at God's blessings and concentrate hard on something you're thankful for. This is how your mind can be strong too. I like to take a big, slow breath to keep me calm. <sighs> Would you like to try? Very good, Jonah. Now you don't have to be scared, even if he finds you. Oh, okay, there's, there's a lot to break down here. Teaching a child how to barricade their bedroom door and hide is not typical children's programming. And we're starting to see angel hair, Jonah's angel hair, deviate pretty majorly from the show that other children might have grown up with. Undoubtedly, the most concerning part of the tape is the last line from Gabby. Now, you don't have to be scared, even if he finds you. It's pretty safe to conclude that whoever he is, he played a pretty major role in Jonah's childhood. And the next sequence of text from Jonah gives us a good idea of who this person was. My mom and I, we weren't always alone. It sounds like Jonah must have grown up with a single mother for a large majority of his childhood, but that wasn't always the case. <sighs> I think that Jonah's father was the sort of person that a child should never have to be around. While many children are left to face that horror alone, Jonah had help. A guardian angel who would do anything to protect him. Anything. Tape 3 is the first episode of Letters with Angel Gabby, a segment of the show in which Gabby reads letters and answers questions from viewers. I'll be honest, I love these episodes because I was always the kid who sent letters to my favorite characters, hoping they might read my heartfelt message. Now, the first thing you'll notice about this episode of Letters with Angel Gabby is that there's just no Angel Gabby to be seen. Uh, it's just Francis. Uh, uh, not that I'm complaining or anything. I mean, <laughs> Francis is great. <laughs> Gotta be one of my top two favorite Angel Hair characters. Anyway, the first question that Francis answers is from a viewer who wants to know, are there any other Angel Hairs? Oddly enough, it seems like Gabby's the only angel that Francis has ever met, or perhaps the only angel in the entire forest. Personally, I haven't met any angels other than Gabby. She's my dearest friend. My only friend, really. Francis assures us, however, that there are more angels out there. He even shows us some art of them. <laughs> Don't they look happy? So the next obvious question is, if there are angel hairs, does that mean that there are also demon hairs? <laughs> Francis eagerly answers that there are lots of demon hairs and that they can even take on different shapes. They aren't always as obvious as some horned, evil-looking creature. Sometimes they can take the form of an opportunity or a feeling. Oh, but Gabby doesn't like for Francis to talk about demons too much. It's just best if we move on. The next episode is a return to the usual lessons that we're used to from Gabby. She and Francis are discussing the armor of God. Francis holds the shield of faith, and Gabby is fitted with the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Despite being kitted out in medieval combat armor, Gabby reminds Francis that they're only holding symbols of real power. Even the sword she holds is just a prop to demonstrate the sharp wit and powerful depth of God's word, the Bible. 
Francis begins to respond, but Gabby just speaks over him once again, spotting an opportunity to speak candidly with Jonah. Knock once if he isn't coming back for a while. Jonah, you're a very brave and very special one of God's children. No, no, it's, it's all right if you weren't listening. Do you remember what we decided to do if you're ever afraid? I want you to take that off the table very carefully, only holding the handle. It might be heavy. Use both hands. Can you hold it up so I can see what kind it is? Now that we've got the pieces apart, let's think of somewhere to hide them where nobody can use them for harm. No, Jonah. Not the kitchen. A lot of people hide things in the kitchen and there's too much traffic for it to be safe. Hmm, no, not the toy chest in your room. It would be very incriminating. Oh, we can learn that word later, but it could get you into trouble. Good, good. Now, see if you can put the book back in front of it. Wonderful job. Be slow and steady as you climb back down. Gabby guides Jonah through the process of stealing, unloading, and hiding what I believe to be his father's gun. She can't afford the risk that it might get used on Jonah. It's important to note that this whole process takes a long time. Jonah was left all alone with access to a firearm. Even if that isn't actively abuse on his father's part, it's extraordinarily negligent and potentially deadly. Thankfully, unbeknownst to Jonah's father, the boy wasn't alone. There was someone around who truly cared for Jonah. Angel Gabby speaks with so much compassion. She's patient, kind, and gentle, even as she directs her young friend to avert something dark and disastrous. There's a beautiful motherly warmth in Gabby's voice that makes it really hard not to trust her. It's a shame that she's about to do something to bring it all into question. Jonah admits that he should be afraid, confused, but Gabby's voice makes him feel at peace, comforting him now just as she did all those years ago when whatever happened, happened. But we still have no idea what actually took place. I think you and I can be sure that Jonah's father was abusive, but that doesn't seem to be the full story. Just the background for one of the most traumatic events in Jonah's life. In tape 4, the divide between Jonah's guardian angel and the thrift store version of Gabby continues to grow. This episode of Angel Hair is all about honesty and the consequences of lying. I'm sorry, Gabby. I was scared you'd be mad at me, but I shouldn't have lied. No, you shouldn't have. It hurt my feelings that you would take one of my angel feathers, but it hurt me so much more that you would lie about it, Francis. Will you ever forgive me? It appears that Francis has taken a feather from Gabby's wing and told a lie to cover his back. Gabby's angry with him, but she asks the viewer if they should forgive the fuzzy falsifier. Uh, I mean, <laughs> what do you think? I mean, personally, I I'm kind of starting to warm up the Francis more and more. Poor fellow's over here getting ignored half the time, so I think we should do him a solid. Do you think we should forgive Francis now that he's apologized? We should? That's very nice of you. It shows a lot of courage to be merciful toward others. <laughs> hey, I think we did the right thing. Of course, when we look at Jonah's copy. Gabby's question is quite a bit different. Honesty is important, Jonah. You should always tell the truth. If you know you're going to be in trouble, you should create a truth for later. Will you ever forgive me? Go to a friend's house when something bad happens, and you won't have to lie about it when they ask you later. They are going to ask you what happened, Jonah, so you have to make sure you're gone when the time comes. We have to make sure you only have truth to tell. She assures him that telling the truth is important. So important that you might have to create a favorable truth for when times get bad. Gabriel thinks something's about to happen that might get Jonah in trouble and tells him that he should go to a friend's house when something bad happens so he can have deniability, an alibi. While forgiveness is important, forgiveness doesn't always lead to trust. Won't it be hard to trust Francis again now, even if we forgive him? Maybe so, but that, that isn't really what matters right now. I'm, I'm sure you figured it out. Gabriel really isn't concerned with what Jonah thinks of Francis. All that matters now is Jonah and his father. Jonah may forgive his father for what he's done. He may be merciful. But that doesn't mean he can ever trust him again. 
And so, in what should have been another bottom of the bin children's show, the angel Gabriel descended to a lonely boy in mortal danger, all to offer him a choice. You can forgive Francis if you want, but it will be difficult to ever trust him again. Revelations warns us of the place prepared for liars. It's up to you, Jonah. What would you like me to do? There aren't any surviving records of what happened. A flood in the municipal building destroyed everything that might have held answers for Jonah, but I think you and I can take a step back and get a pretty good idea of what Jonah asked Gabriel to do. For Jonah, monsters didn't live in his closet. In fact, that was the only place where Jonah felt safe, hidden away in darkness and silence. But what if it didn't have to be that way? What if the world didn't have monsters in it? What if the world didn't have to be wrong anymore? I just want to be safe, said the little voice to his friend in the TV. There was only ever one way to ensure Jonah's safety. One way to protect him permanently. And that's exactly what Gabriel did. Jonah went to a friend's house and came home to lots of questions. When police were done questioning Jonah about his father's death, they left Eulila and her son to their meager measure of grief. Jonah had grown accustomed to finding comfort and loneliness, but this was different. Gabriel no longer spoke to him. The monster outside of Jonah's room had been slain. His father's chilled body was miles away in the sort of place no child can picture. But it cost Jonah his only real friend. He could play the recordings all he liked, but she wasn't there. Gabby wasn't alive like she used to be. Jonah changed almost immediately. His mother, having survived one nightmare, found herself waking up to a horrific new reality. She had to confront the serious possibility that her baby boy had just murdered his father. What was happening to her son? And how do you move forward with your life after someone you love does something like this? You forgive. She scrubbed the house of anything that might remind Jonah of his father. She remembered so that Jonah could forget. She took the burden from her son's shoulders upon herself, and in doing so, gave him an opportunity for new life. One word that he didn't have to live forever carrying the pain and loneliness from his childhood. And it worked. Jonah forgot until he came across a small set of VHS tapes in a thrift store, and they changed his life once again. Tape 5 changes things up. The footage from Jonah's childhood tapes has been exhausted. The official records are no help, so there's only one place left to turn for answers. He returns to his childhood home to search for something, anything that might give him a clue about his past, about Gabriel. In his mother's attic, Jonah found a new series of tapes, but they didn't contain episodes of angel hair. Instead, they were educational tapes intended to help parents to understand their child's psychology, their stress, their anger, their aggression. Eulila was working hard to understand her son, but it's obvious from the tapes that she believed Jonah harbored some level of responsibility. Jonah also found a couple of letters addressed to his mother, one from Upstate Broadcasting, the company that aired angel hair when Jonah was a child. We don't really learn a ton from this document, but the next letter shows you just how far Eulila was willing to go to find the truth about what her son experienced. A cease and desist from Keith Publishing, the owners of Angel Hair, demands that Eulila stop digging into the program. The company claims that Eulila went so far as to approach employees of KP at their homes, and they even accuse her of attempting to steal company documents. But really quick, by the way, you might be wondering where I'm getting the mother's name from since it's never actually mentioned in Angel Hair. Don't worry. We'll get to that. We also learn that Mrs. Whitman is actually Dr. Whitman, or at least that's what Keith Publishing believes. Clearly, Jonah's mother realized that Angel Hair was an important part of her son's life, 
It wouldn't surprise me if she stopped her son from watching the show after the incident with his father and caused the split between Jonah and Gabriel. But the tapes betray her underlying suspicions. You and I know the real story, but being at the center of the story changes things. I don't fault Ulila for not believing her son's stories about the divine rabbit hitman that came out of their TV. And Jonah doesn't blame her either. Jonah's mother knows a lot, maybe more than Jonah ever will, but that doesn't mean it's time to head downstairs for an interrogation. Answers might only be an uncomfortable conversation away, but Eulila gave Jonah the chance to forget, and now she's finally got that same chance. He can't take that away from her. No matter what, he won't tell Eulila about what's happening. Jonah simply walks out the door to follow the same path that his mother did, a path of obsession. And just like her, he does it all alone. Just as Jonah searches for answers, so are the viewers of Angel Hair. The next episode of the series brings us the penultimate installment of Letters with Angel Gabby. Once again, we're given the gift of a quiet moment with my man Francis. This episode has a little bit of everything in it. Discussion of the dark and unfathomable. Honey Bunny asks if there are other types of angel animals, and Tin Moose wants to know if there are other magical creatures. What fascinating questions. Thanks for being so curious, you two. Of course there are other magical creatures. Gabby isn't magical after all. If you see a magical creature, it's probably an unholy apparition trying to lure you into trouble. Trust me, even the friendly ones can be a wolf in sheep's clothing. It also has Francis slander, which I will not stand for. Coy asks if there is anyone in the woods besides the angel and the badger. My, my name is Francis. It's followed by some important lore about the other angel hairs. Next we have a couple letters from Mary Stone and Doom Gamer 3000. What lovely names. Thanks for writing, friends. They ask what Gabby's duties are and if other angels like to come down and help. I think you'll be interested to know that Gabby has a lot of very busy angel friends. They have a lot of work to do all over the world, and their duty is to help those in need. Our next letter is from R. Pakula. They write, Do you know how you became Jonah's guardian angel? Do you remember anything about Jonah? Inky Lemon asks, How high can Gabby fly? What a funny question. But something really odd is going on with Francis, and it's not totally clear what his whole deal is yet. In the last episode of Letters with Angel Gabby, he was certainly excited to talk about the demons. Now this. I get the sense that Francis is going through some stuff right now. Perhaps he's simply too open and interested in the darkest parts of the world. Perhaps they're interested in him, too. But enough about Badger Boy. Jonah has a plan. It has been years and years and years since he last spoke to Gabby. But why? Why is it that Gabriel seems frozen in time? There's really only one thing that sets apart Jonah's recordings from the live broadcast that he watched as a child. The fact that the live broadcasts were, well, live. But now, in the modern internet age, everyone has the ability to broadcast something in real time. The answer's been right in front of Jonah the whole time. Right there on the very channel which Jonah has been using to update you on his journey. The internet let Jonah remember his closest childhood friend. Now, it's gonna let him resurrect her. Some part of Jonah doesn't want it to work. If it doesn't, he can still believe that there's a chance he's just losing his mind. It's a lot easier to accept than the alternative, that an angel really did kill his father at the word of a child. Jonah can feel comfortable around Gabriel. He can forgive Gabriel for everything that happened. After all, it's what Jonah wanted, right? But even if he needs Gabby, can Gabriel really be trusted? Jonah knows what it's like to be scared of someone you need. But right now, above everything else, he needs answers. Closure. Is he crazy or complicit? 
Angel Gabby. Oh, Angel Gabby. Hello. Um. Gabriel. <laughs> Angel Gabby. Good morning, Francis. I love to hear you call. Have you brought a new friend with you? Yes, but I'm fearful, Angel Gabby. I never know what to say. <gasps> oh my god. What? Um, it's, it's me. J Jonah, I'm here. Do you remember me? I'm so happy to see you, Jonah. <laughs> Just look how well you've grown. <sighs> Complicit. Of course, it's beyond unfair to hold Jonah culpable in this. He was a child, hurt and alone, desperately in need of protection. But that doesn't change how Jonah feels. Jonah was reunited with Gabby. The purpose of the channel was fulfilled. The first in a long string of mysteries was solved. It was all real. Every hope and fear and conviction that wrestled inside of Jonah had been confirmed all at once. All that mattered right now was that she was back. Not only that, but she kept coming back. Night after night, Gabby came down from the clouds. Jonah reached out to her, spoke to her, and told her about his new life. It was everything Jonah wanted. Everything he needed. And Jonah finally felt complete. Now, you'd think it would end there, but there's a surprise. One last tape, an Easter special, hidden away until now. There aren't any obviously shocking revelations on this tape, but Jonah uploads it anyway. Another testament to the love and care his guardian angel showed him. But just because there aren't any obviously shocking revelations doesn't mean that there's nothing important hidden in the episode. See, Francis is once again having some strange issues. Gabby tells us that Easter eggs were traditionally painted red to symbolize the blood of Christ, but Francis depicts some unsettling imagery on his eggs. The first is Ouroboros, a symbol from Gnosticism representing unity, death, and rebirth. If you're unaware of what Gnosticism is, I'm not going to go like crazy in depth, but I'll, I'll cover everything that's relevant. It's basically an offshoot from the early Christian church that merged with some pre-existing occult ideas. There are a couple key concepts that set the belief systems apart from one another. For instance, Christians believe that God is a perfect being who created the universe as an act of love and a demonstration of his glory. It was originally perfect, but an aspect of that perfection was the existence of humans who were capable of choosing between good and evil. They chose evil, and that's how the world became broken and flawed. In contrast, the Gnostic conception of God, the Demiurge, is an evil being that designed our universe with its flaws as an act of malice. Living in this universe is supposed to hurt. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This one shot has caused me more grief and confusion than any other shot in the entire series because of one question. Why? Does Francis just have like an unhealthy interest in the occult? Or is this supposed to imply that the world is ruled by the Demiurge? If so, that recontextualizes everything in the series. We've taken for granted so far that Gabby is pure and had good intentions behind the drastic measures she took to protect Jonah, but if Gabriel isn't an agent of a perfect god, and is instead a spirit loosely obligated to serving a cosmic tyrant, I don't think we can take that for granted. Which, to be clear, I'm not trying to disrespect anyone who has beliefs that are in line with Gnosticism or say that you're bad or anything like that, I'm just saying that from the perspective of Gnosticism, divine beings are usually not the most trustworthy. I'll talk about this like a, a lot more <laughs> in the analysis section of this video, but all we can take from this episode are more questions. The Easter episode ends with a familiar scene. Francis calls up into the clouds for Gabby. Over and over and over he calls for her. It's different this time. Jonah is streaming the episode so he can talk to Gabby once again, but she doesn't show up. 
Francis is left alone on the forest floor, calling to no one. Almost a year later, Jonah posted another update. His nightly live streams had gone on for a while, but after Easter, everything stopped. Gabby no longer responded to Francis's call. Live streaming the episodes did nothing. The forest had lost its angel. Had Jonah done or said something bad? He'd only just found answers and already he could feel himself slipping back into obsession. He started the live stream again. And this time, he didn't shut it down at the end of the night. Jonah left his laptop open and listened to Francis calling out to Gabby on loop for six and a half days. Every second of sleep was a risk, a tiny window of weakness that threatened to separate him from peace forever. Every ounce of his being was dedicated to the hope that he would earn back her presence, that somehow this would make her reappear. He gave her everything. Everything. So, why didn't she return? Couldn't she see what Jonah was putting himself through? <laughs> what, she was willing to kill for him, but she wasn't even willing to show herself to him? Jonah is devastated. But let's not forget, Jonah isn't the only one who relies on Gabriel. Francis told us that he and Gabby aren't alone in the forest. But as Jonah is intimately familiar, sometimes it's better, safer, to be alone. For the first time since Gabby disappeared from the live streams, something changes. Two dark ears peer over the clouds, and Francis comes face to face with something new. Immediately, Jonah is suspicious of this new rabbit. Actually, suspicion is putting it far, far too lightly. Jonah is afraid of him. Who is he? Why is he here? What does he want? Is it his fault that Gabby's missing? As this new man comes into Jonah's life, so many buried traumas and fears are dragged to the surface. Old scars violently torn open again. But you don't take your eyes off the danger once it's stepped into the room with you. So Jonah watches. Jonah watches because it's safe. Jonah watches because to quit now would be to abandon Gabby in her time of need, and that's not how she raised him. The next tape shows us a little bit more about this new creature as it descends to the forest floor and greets Francis. The first episode of Angel Hair seems to play out just like the tapes from the thrift store, sans Gabby. Perhaps the most surprising thing is that Francis is acting totally normal. He even seems to know something about whatever this thing is. Francis. Yes, but I'm fearful, Angel Zaggy. I never know what to say. Angel Zaggy, he calls him. Zaggy? An angel? I don't know who that could be referring to. At least, there's no angel named Zaggy in the Bible. Oddly enough, Francis is the only one who seems to want to be here. The new angel speaks in a very monotone, almost sarcastic voice, completely divorced from the warmth and care that characterized Gabby. That's okay, Francis. I'll show you how to meet someone new. First, you introduce yourself and ask them to do the same. Nonetheless, he stays close to the script, acting like nothing is wrong. It makes Jonah sick, watching his childhood be defaced by this... this imposter. Jonah gets the sense that this so-called angel is watching him back. He plays along. There's no telling what would happen if he doesn't keep up the act. When Zag asks for something special to the viewer and Jonah replies with, Gabby, the gray rabbit seems to become irritated. Sharing something important lets others learn about what makes you tick. As it gets further into the episode, changes to the script become more apparent. Zaggy's personality is clearly quite different from Gabby's, and that changes how he responds to Francis's problems and questions. When Francis asked Gabby how to find the strength to face each day, she encouraged him to find fortitude through faith and hope. Now, Zag tells Francis that strength is something that comes from wisdom, and that wisdom is the result of respect and penitence. So, Zag believes that recognizing your shortcomings allows you to make fewer mistakes in the future. 
That's how you face hardship. As he says this, he stares directly into the camera. Right at Jonah. He wants a reaction. He knows. Jonah knows he knows. So, why fight it? Maybe it's time for the direct approach. I know you can see me, he says, challenging the mysterious hair. And gets completely ignored. (sighs) Screw it. Time for a break. Jonah decides to pause the show for a while, but he keeps an eye on the stream. The frozen frame of Zag's face turns out not to be so frozen. The analog angel's eyes shift from side to side as he watches Jonah's movements through the room. If he can't get a moment of peace with the stream running, Jonah opts to up the stakes for both parties. He threatens to end the broadcast. Let's follow the stream and... You're the one airing this? You aren't in a TV station. How are you doing this? Are you able to record? Why did you put the show back on? Are you with Wreath? What, all of a sudden you got nothing? Fran, do you know this guy? Um... Looks a little old for cartoon rabbits. I came to find her, genius. What are you doing? Wait, wait, he he knows about Wreath? As in Wreath of Life, the creators of the show? And as for Gabby, he came to find her. Shouldn't he know what happened to her? I mean, obviously he had something to do with... No, no, I guess there wasn't really any evidence that Zag was responsible for her disappearance, but then where the heck did she go? If not for some other powerful supernatural entity, what could possibly cause an angel to just vanish? Something has to be wrong here. I don't know what, but something has to be wrong. In the next episode of Letters with Angel Gabby, Francis's final episode, he nervously answers questions about Gabby's absence. This episode must be taking place during one of Jonah's live streams, as we even see an appearance from the dark-haired Zag himself. I kind of wonder if each of the letter episodes takes place after Jonah started doing the live streams. That would explain why Gabby hasn't been present in a single one, but there's not really enough information for me to say one way or another. That's a fun thought, though. In any case, this episode actually has some really interesting details hidden in it. The most important being some absolutely critical Fran Francis lore. Are you ready for this? It's about to change everything we know about the Badger. I've got a letter from Carol Andrea here that asks what Francis does for a living. Thanks for writing, friend. I'm an actuary. Oh. Actually, that doesn't, that doesn't change too much. What is interesting is that Francis tells us a little bit about his first meeting with Gabby, and even shows us a sketch that he made of their first meeting. Alan Dulles, Magic Quill, and Fitta Seelman are all curious about how Gabby and I got to know each other. Well, y'all, to tell you the truth, I used to be in a really bad place in life. At my lowest low, I called out for help, and would you know it, Gabby came. I've been calling her ever since. Our next question is from Ivan Blue Cool. Gabby appreciates your letter, Ivan. They want to know if every angel gets their own sword. Isn't Gabby's arsenal impressive? Though I'll tell you, the sword isn't her only weapon. Angel hairs have a vast set of tools at their disposal to ensure they're equipped for every challenge. Here's a little sketch I made of the tool she used when we first met. Ain't that neat? It almost looks like Gabby's using some sort of sound-based weapon, but I don't actually think it's a weapon. The Bible describes angels as being insanely loud. Revelation 10 is one example of this. It says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, The voices of the seven thunders spoke. So yeah, uh, pretty loud. And uh, keep in mind that Gabriel is supposed to be one of the most powerful angels in all of existence. So this could literally just be like Gabriel speaking normally, which kind of makes you wonder how Francis stood up to that without just going like in a cloud of like fur and pink mist. Anyway, whatever. (laughs) Another viewer asks, if someone has to do something bad to survive, Does this mean that they're always a bad person? Now we've got a letter from Frog. Hello again, Frog. They ask, if someone has 
to do something bad to survive. Are they always a bad person? I've asked the same thing to Gabby once, a long time ago. She told me that no matter why people do bad things, they've always got another chance to do better. I haven't known her to be wrong yet. Her answer implies that the question isn't about who's good and who's bad, but rather that the important part is that everyone can continue to try to do better. Everyone gets a second, third, fourth, and fifth chance, and so on and so on. She is an angel, after all. In any case, after this, a question comes in about Francis' new friend, Zaggy. This viewer just wants to know how Francis feels about his ill-mannered ally. But Francis doesn't get a chance to respond. A letter here from Changeling Arts who asks, How does Francis feel about his new pal there? Wait, who are you talking to? How long have you been... You know what? We've got bigger fish to fry. Come on. Oh, well, keep running, y'all. Gabby loves to hear you call. Goodbye. And the next episode picks up immediately where Letters with Angel Gabby left off. In the meantime, Jonah's been doing a little digging of his own into Francis's new friend. Who is this Angel Zag, anyway? Assuming that this is actually an angel, there's only one with a name even remotely similar. Zagzagel. Gustav Davidson's Dictionary of Angels says that Zagzagel was perhaps most famous for being the angel in Moses' burning bush. If that's true, we're dealing with a real celebrity here. That said, I'm not fully convinced of anything yet. I get that Jonah is starting to trust this guy, but honestly, I think he's being a little bit naive. I mean, are you really convinced that Zag had nothing to do with Gabby's disappearance? Seems to me like he's breaking just about every other rule in the book. Right now, Zaggy's trying to get Francis to participate in his investigation, but Francis seems dead set on sticking to the script. Honestly, I didn't even know that Francis knew there was a script. I just assumed that Gabby was the only sentient being in the tape. You're telling me that all this time, both characters were fully aware that they were stuck in the show? Francis just let Gabby talk over him all those times. That's some real dedication to the craft right there from old Frankie. Oh, the Badger insists that there be some sort of lesson keeping with Gabby's usual expectations for the show. Before then, she was always answering her call. Oh, um... I'm not really supposed to. Sure, but this is an exception. I think Gabby still likes to try to have a lesson. Seems weird to be such a stickler for the rules right now, but... Okay, Zagzagel decides to go along with it. Teamwork. Diligence. Proverbs 27.17. Work with that. Teamwork, diligence, Proverbs 27.17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. This verse is about helping each other to recognize your own flaws to grow in understanding. So, basically he's just telling Francis to cooperate and spill the beans about what he knows. Zag starts to act like some kind of detective, which is a little ridiculous, but I guess that's what we need right now. It's a logical approach, and Francis, the organized little actuary, can get on board with that. Well, in that case, I have some documents that may help. Jonah can too, sorta. It makes him uneasy, still, but Zag's investigation seems to have direction and the possibility of some results. That's more than Jonah can achieve on his own. He offers to help, but Zagzagel turns him down. Much appreciated, but I don't know you, pal. So how's about keeping the lights on? That'll be enough. All that's necessary is keeping the stream running so that he and Francis don't get snuffed out of existence. Unless... Uh, oh, looks like Francis is back to tell us about the dream he had on Easter morning. Sometimes, as Gabby's confidant, I get visions bestowed upon me in my sleep. I like to doodle them down for giggles, and this one came to me Easter morning. Let's have a look. And you said that was the first morning she didn't... Ah, oh, well, ain't this bupkis. You'd think a kid's flick would keep it simple. Is this the only style you know? I'm not sure what you mean, Angel Zaggy. That's just exactly as I saw it. Would you stop calling me Zaggy? She's gotta be so darn traditional. That... Uh, hold on. Francis can just receive revelations from Gabby through dreams? He's just gonna drop that little tidbit of lore on us without any warning? Okay. So it seems that Gabby appeared to him in her biblically accurate form the morning of her disappearance. Zag must be able to derive more from this information than us, because he hatches a plan. They might not be able to make any progress in the investigation here in the forest. But what if they weren't in the forest? Turns out, maybe there's a way for Jonah to help after all. If Jonah can broadcast anything, then that gives the team something they haven't had for a long time. 
options. But doing so means making. A sacrifice. But uh, no, no, not that kind of sacrifice. A personal sacrifice. Here's the situation. Zagzagel and Francis might be able to find Gabby, but they can't do it in Angel here. They have to leave the show and Jonah has to shut down the stream. Then the show will be empty, abandoned. The life within that had gotten Jonah through so much would be gone and he would have to face someplace new. Does Jonah have the strength to let that go? To confront new challenges head on? No, he doesn't. But he does have the strength to cling desperately to faith and hope that Gabby is still out there, somewhere. The strength to do what's right. Angel hair meant everything to Jonah Whitman. And that's exactly why he has to let it die. Jonah flings caution to the wind. Is Zagzagil trustworthy? Who knows? But Jonah doesn't care anymore. All that matters now is finding Gabriel. And if that means obeying the commands of a mysterious, unfathomably powerful, and possibly evil rabbit, so be it. Jonah shuts off the broadcast and rushes out to follow the directions that Zag gave him. Uh, don't worry, it only involves the slightest bit of breaking and entering. Jonah sneaks through the halls and finds the room specified by Zaggy. The small church library contains several archaic learning devices that I believe pre-internet humans called books. But no tapes. At least, nothing resembling angel hair. That is, until Jonah moves around some of the contents of the library to reveal a very old-looking film canister labeled Wild Hair. Well, I'll be. Seems like Zaggy wasn't lying to Jonah after all. He really isn't from Angel Hair. But once upon a time, he had his own show. A detective cartoon from the 1960s. Jonah manages to get the film playing on an old projector setup, but that's only half the battle. He sets up his webcam to have a good view of the episode, boots up OVS, goes live, and just like that, we see our old friend Frankie freed from his furry form. Not only that, but we see a new face, Francine. Seems like the whole gang has already been acquainted with each other. So Francis didn't just migrate to this show from Angel Hair, but used to be a part of Wild Hair before Gabby was ever in the picture. Makes me wonder just how far back his history goes. Then there's Zagzagel, or Zag Wild as he's known in this universe. A gruff detective who's tackled countless cases to expose the truth. I suppose that explains the whole investigative attitude and the strange word choices we've been seeing from Zag all this time. Huh. Even looks like he's got a Wreath of Life logo pinned to his lapel. Turns out, Wild Hair is pretty different from Angel Hair. Zag regularly has to shoot his way out of danger, the quiet forest is swapped out for the hustle and bustle of a sprawling metropolis, and there's not a single animal in sight. Come to think of it, it's really no wonder why his demeanor varies so radically from the angel that spent her time lazing about in the clouds. Gabby's life inside Angel Hair was much simpler, more peaceful. It was exactly the sort of escape that a young, scared child might have dreamt of. These differences affect everything within this world, and good thing too. Zag brought Jonah and Francis here because, as a mystery show, Wild Hair works in a very specific way. No matter what mystery Zag is trying to solve, he will inevitably find clues that lead him to the truth. The first of which being Francis's document depicting his dream from Gabriel. That's more like it. Starlet finds a new stage, facing grueling new demands. Can she handle the glamour of a life among the stars? Only time will tell. So what does it mean, Detective? Let's think. All the clues have to be here. It's how the show works. Finds a new stage. Is she coming back? Here, the biblically accurate angel has been replaced by a newspaper article describing the rise of an up-and-coming star. Naturally, this starlet is Gabby, but that's not all we need to know. What's the new stage that she's taking? The rules of the world are breaking down in front of Zag. He doesn't have the answers that he promised. Try as he might, he ends up supernaturally stumped. Luckily, Jonah sees something he doesn't. Zagzagel has set hoop after hoop in front of Jonah, and he's jumped through them all. In return, Zag simply left him in the dark, refusing to answer questions or share information. 
It's clear that Zag neither trusts nor respects Jonah. And enough is enough. The gray angel didn't call on Gabriel like Jonah did. He didn't wait for her, watch for her. He didn't know her like Jonah did. If his guardian angel isn't responding when he calls for her, it isn't because she doesn't want to. It's because... It's because she can't. This whole time I've wanted to point the finger at Zag. Oh, we can't trust him. There's something wrong with him. He made Gabriel disappear. No. Jonah made her disappear. Everything that had happened, it, it must have been because he brought her back to begin with. Jonah had to make it right, but he couldn't do it alone. Even if Zag was acting like a pain, he was still helpful. He was sharp as a whip, and he knew the rules of this strange, angelic game. Francis, too. He knew Gabby better than anyone. Finally, Gabby had made Jonah a promise. When you call, I will always come to you. If she was out there, anywhere, she would do everything in her power to make good on her word. Altogether, the three of them were the best chance there was to bring Gabriel back from the brink. All the boys needed to do was call a bit louder. Jonah explained to Zag and Francis how he had managed to reach into their world through streaming, and together, they came up with a new plan to reach Gabby. Meanwhile, just one room over, a new disaster is taking place. More specifically, a flood. Zaggy's inbox is overflowing with letters sent in by viewers like you. Of course, a busy guy like Zag doesn't have time for mundanities like reading letters from children, so Francine takes the opportunity to do it herself. This is really the only time in the whole series where we get any background information on Zagzagel. Fran, on the other hand, jumps at the opportunity to answer a few personal questions. She tells us about how the two of them met, about Zag's lack of regard for office administration activities, and about his bumpy history with a poker dealer who broke his heart. Finally, one particularly bold viewer asks about Wreath of Life. Unfortunately, while Zag and presumably Gabby know about Wreath, it seems like that information might be outside of Francine and Francis's pay grade. I guess our questions about the show's origins will remain unanswered for the time being, since right after this, Fran gets called away to attend to other matters around the office. Zaggy, Francis, and Jonah are making their final preparations to carry out their plan. They need screens. Lots and lots of screens. Jonah thinks that if they stream enough episodes of Angel Hair through enough screens, Gabby might be able to find her way home to him. Screens, huh? Zag's got just the thing. He leads Francis through the dark halls of his office to a room. Inside, every single wall is covered with dozens of CRT displays. Francis's response to the room is disconcerting, to say the least. Oh my, demon hair boxes. Why can't this dang badger stop saying things that make my head hurt? Demon hair boxes? I'm gonna be honest with you. I got literally no idea what this means or why he says that. Like, I assume he's referring to the TVs, but why would he think of TVs as being demon hair boxes? It doesn't... Whatever. There's a warning on the back of the door, too. At least one icon required for entry. An icon is an image of the divine, something like a painting of Jesus or a depiction of the Trinity or even an angel. I guess... Either Zag himself could fulfill this requirement, or perhaps the dove pen on his lapel counts as an icon of the Holy Spirit, which appears in the Bible as a dove. It's important to note that one function of an icon is its use in exorcisms. So is the icon holding back something in this room? Is that why you gotta have one to go in? I, I don't know, you know what, it, it doesn't matter. We'll get to it later. For now, the team has what they need. Jonah also does what he can, grabbing every screen in his house and preparing to stream to them. As they're making their final preparations, he decides to pester Zag with a few final questions. One last desperate attempt to get some answers. What exactly are you? That's classified, pal. How do you see through the screen? Don't worry about it. How do you know Gabby? Oh, 
were there. We were associates. Is she in trouble? I'm not her dad, pal. I don't care for her hand-holding approach, but her work's none of my business. You ask me? Kids are smart. Show them what to do, they'll figure it out without the song and dance. How old is your show? Are there more? Look, buddy, I need you to slow down and ask yourself an important question right now. Think about your little rabbit friend and really ask. Do you want to know? Or do you want her back? Huh? That's a good question, but a hard one for Jonah to answer. He's been pursuing answers all along, trying to understand what's been happening to him all his life. But Jonah doesn't have to understand in order to help. All he needs to know is that she's safe. He can leave the past in the past and move forward. He can finally live the life that Gabriel and his mother worked for. The seats are filled. The curtains have been raised. Only one question remains. Will the star take the stage? It's Gabby. Gabs? Gabs! Can you hear me? Gabriel was incomplete. Before Jonah had started the first live stream, he convinced himself that he still needed Gabriel. He couldn't help himself, and neither could she. Gabriel wanted to see the boy she had befriended once more. So she reached out, and it changed her. Fractured her. One live stream at a time, she got lost online. A piece of herself on one website, a bit more there, spread to the furthest reaches of humanity's most spectacular tool. Broken apart by the boy she saved. Gabriel is completely disoriented, but it worked. Francis calls out to her, and she hears him, but she can't tell where it's coming from. There's so much noise. Millions of troubled kids, all in need of help, crying out online for someone to protect them. Kids who need Gabby. Kids just like Jonah. He sat in silence, watching Gabby's broken form on the screen, listening to her crackling voice. This was his fault to begin with, and now he was making it worse. She was trying to help everyone. She was giving these kids the very same thing that she had given him, but he had taken her away from that. He had taken her away from, from them. We came to get you, he said to her. What else was there to say? Zaggy assured her that Jonah was fine. He's all grown up now. He can take care of himself. She doesn't have to be there for him anymore. Gabriel looked at Jonah. She looked into the eyes which she knew so well, and she remembered. She remembered quiet nights with that little face pressed up near the screen, whispering answers to her questions. The mess he made when she taught him how to paint eggs for Easter. She remembered it all. Even the nights that weren't quiet. She remembered how he would shake on nights when his parents fought. She wanted so badly to be able to reach out and dry his tears. But there was only so much she could do. So much she could ever do. She remembered his tired eyes nervously shifting to and from the door, and she remembered the fear that filled those eyes every time that door opened. Those same eyes were looking back at her now. He was so different. That fear was gone. Jonah was all grown up, 
and he didn't need her anymore. He wasn't hers anymore. Of course, she knew that he never had been, but she was so thankful for her time with him. So thankful she remembered. I should go. You should make me forget again, Jonah said. It was barely audible above the cacophony of children's voices ringing in Gabby's head. Zagzagel didn't understand. Hadn't Jonah put in all this work to save her? To bring her back? But Gabby knew Jonah. Knew that this was exactly who she had helped him to be. The sort of person who, despite all the hurt, is able to put others first. It's true that you're not a child anymore. I can't help you how I once did. But it's kind of fun, isn't it? You can be anything you want now, Jonah. Just like I always knew you could. You certainly are how I remember. Jonah has changed, and now Gabby needs him. When Jonah was young, Gabby had to be unshakable. She gave his life stability. But what if she isn't stable anymore herself? It's one thing to be trapped in a show that airs once a night for a handful of children. It's totally different being stretched in 10 million directions at once by needy kids. But Jonah understands the internet. He has what Gabby and Zagzagel need to be there for everyone who needs them. Gabby reaches out to the screen to touch Jonah's hand one more time, and she makes him an offer. She can always be there for him if he can be there for her. He can be the angel's man on the outside, their wreath of life, bringing the love that he received to an entirely new generation of kids. He can teach them the lessons that he's learned. Out of Jonah's pain and brokenness comes faith, hope, and the strength to face each day. Out of Jonah's hurt comes help. That is, if you take everything at face value. Before we tie up all the loose ends, I want to take a quick moment to say thank you for watching this far. We're starting to creep up on 100,000 subscribers, and if everyone who watched this far subscribed, I think we'd hit it pretty fast. Of course, your viewership alone is enough for me. But I would love to make more videos for you in the future. There are a couple of final pieces of the puzzle that we have to go over before we can start to analyze what really took place here. The first of which is this painting that we were shown back in the second episode of Letters with Angel Gabby. We can clearly see Gabby in the front and Zag in the back, but what about that brown rabbit in the middle? There are a lot of theories as to who this unknown angel is, with the most likely options being Michael or Raphael. My money is on Michael, since Gabriel, Zagzagel, and Michael already form a trio in Davidson's Dictionary of Angels. There really isn't a ton to go on here, but I would assume that this final hair has a show of their own as well. We just haven't seen it yet. It's pretty fun to theorize what kind of show that might be. Maybe one day we'll learn more about them, but for the time being, this is one end that will stay loose. The second loose end is a bit more substantial, an angel hair video game. Hello there. My name is Angel Gabby, and I can't wait to have fun learning with you. You can literally go download this right now and play it yourself with the link in the description. It's a simple game for kids, but you can click around and interact with Gabby, Francis, and Zag. Your goal is to take a ride with Gabby through the sky in a hot air balloon, but you need three tickets to do so. You earn these tickets by visiting each character and playing a fun educational game with them. Zagzagel teaches you how to spell while reading the newspaper like a dad who didn't want you. Gabby caringly encourages you during a matching game, and Francis, well. See, before you can meet with Zag or Gabby, you have to play Francis's game, but it seems like his game doesn't even work. It's supposed to be a game of whack the demon rabbit, but there uh, quite clearly aren't any horned hair to be seen. It's not necessarily the right thing to do, but Francis doesn't want you to leave empty handed. He'll just give you the tickets, and Gabby doesn't have to know. Is it cheating? Cheating? No. I don't think it's very helpful to think of it like that. We're just adapting a little. There's nothing wrong with that. So, congratulations on receiving your first ticket. See you later. 
And remember, this is our little secret. Next, you go visit Zag to learn how to spell. I know this looks hard, but don't worry, guys. I'm good at spelling. At least twice as good as a five-year-old with PTSD and a... Oh. Oh, no. Uh, whatever. Uh, maybe the all-seeing Archangel Gabriel didn't notice me cheating, even though a bunch of inanimate, surprisingly literate lily pads are fully aware of my guilt. You did it! A clear sky can be just as lovely as a cloudy one. We can just hand over our tickets and, uh... Hmm. Wait a minute. Uh-oh. There's something strange about your tickets, Jonah. Uh-oh. Please be honest with me. Oh, no. Did you earn all of these fair and square? Yeah, so it turns out that we've been caught. And there's no getting around the price that has to be paid. It isn't fair to claim the reward without doing the work. Come with me back to Francis's spot. I want to have a word with both of you. However, it's not us that has to pay the price. It's poor, poor little Francis. Oh, hello there, Gabby. Um, shouldn't y'all be up in the air balloon by now? Francis, do you want to tell me why you would give Jonah a ticket when he didn't earn it? Um, well, we tried to play the game, but it didn't work, so I felt bad. I just didn't want him to miss out on any fun. I'm sure that was part of it. But do you think you might have had another reason, Francis? Maybe a more selfish one? Oh, I'm sorry, Gabby. I was scared. I know I've got inner demons, and I didn't want to get whacked on the outside for what I've got stewing within me. It's all right, Francis. Nobody is without fault. But you shouldn't hide from your shortcomings. I'm glad you were able to come around to the truth. But you still cheated Jonah out of a game, and you still have to address your inner demons. I know, Gabby. Click on the mallet and you can whack any demon hairs you see. It's alright, Jonah. Go on. Just click on the mallet, and I'll help Francis do what must be done. I understand. This is for your own good, Francis. I hope that's a valuable lesson for you both. I'll never run from my demons again, Gabby. I promise. We've been watching him quietly stumble through the entire series. It started off small. He let his fear rule him. He lacked the faith, hope, and strength to live his life in spite of the rain. And he struggled with honesty, even as he lived alongside an angel. Perhaps most concerning, though, was his intense fascination with demons and the occult. I don't fully understand why the weasel is so interested in dark spirits, but one thing is clear, they're interested in him, too. Gabby tried to warn him. Demons don't dart about dark holes in the forest. They aren't horned figures with scary faces, nasty attitudes, and pitchforks. They're subtle. Sneaky. And now... It's time for Francis to deal with the inner demons that have made their home within his heart. After Francis has been thoroughly bonked and reprimanded, Jonah, I, I mean, the player, gets to go on their hot air balloon ride. Then, the game is over. There's not a ton of narrative to go over here. It's mostly separate from the main story, but I think it finally gives us some answers to our long-standing questions about Francis. Who is he? What's been going on with him throughout the whole series? The concept of biblically accurate angels stormed the internet some time back, replacing the weird baby cherubim that you see in classical paintings with a more eldritch sort of creature. However, while there's been a lot of interest in angels, demons seem to have been spared this treatment. In most media, demons are very tangible. It's an extremely effective concept, but angel hair is trying to do something different. Angel hair is one of very few modern works that not only seeks to show you biblically accurate angels, but also to present a biblically accurate picture of demons as invisible, cunning, hateful creatures who begrudgingly do their work from the shadows of the human mind. The name of a demon's game is subtlety. Demons don't need to possess people and turn them into serial killers to get their job done. Often, it's enough to quietly sabotage every positive connection that someone has in their life. 
They sow anxiety in someone's heart that prevents them from making healthy connections. They sow despair to try to make every day feel overwhelming. They discourage honesty and lead you into a death of a thousand cuts. Little lies that seem insignificant to us, but can cause more damage than we expect. I know that seems like a little bit of a tangent, but the whole point I'm making is this. Francis represents the everyman. He has struggles that are bigger than himself and often fails to rise to the occasion. His successes are found with the help of others and are only achieved in fear and trembling. Francis is our guy on the inside, fighting against his inner demons. Anyway, I, I won't go too deeply into this, not yet. Soon I plan to talk about another piece of fiction that covers biblically accurate demons in much greater depth. And with that, we've covered every bit of material from Angel here. But, as I said, there's one piece of evidence that not many people have caught, which is crazy because it's, it's big, like really big. As it turns out, angel hair and wild hair, yeah, they're not isolated incidents. The rabbit hole goes deeper. It turns out that there's another one of these living TV shows on the air, and it's also very important to Jonah's story. The West Patch was a children's TV show released in 1989 based on a series of books by Julia Padilli. Originally called Wild Winds in the West Patch, Julia's family decided to sell the rights to the books after her death. It's weird though. The new show isn't particularly faithful to the author's original intent, and it's been twisted into something darker than these books were ever meant to be. You might think everything is normal until the end of the first episode, when one character finds a body hidden in a shed. Only three episodes of The West Patch have been released on YouTube, though they're all unlisted as of right now. That's actually why I think so few people know how important it is. But just for you, I'll link to all three episodes in the description. Wink. But how does this series relate back to Jonah and Angel Hair? Well, here's the crazy part. The series was purchased and produced by none other than Keith Publishing. The same Keith Publishing that would later own and distribute Angel Hair. In my mind, that pretty much guarantees that they knew exactly what they were getting into when they took Francis and Angel Gabby under their incredibly shady wing. Honestly, you could make an argument that this is just meant to be a fun little Easter egg. I mean, that's where the connections end after all, and... Yo, what the crap? Is that Jonah's mom? Welcome home, kids. I fully believe that this series will be important for understanding the complete story of Angel Hair. I mean, these interview sections are minor, but this directly ties Jonah's story into this narrative as well. I wish I could tell you more, but I don't have the full picture yet. Angel Hair was relatively complete when I found it but the West Patch is currently all tied up in the business side of production. Contracts, deadlines, months of downtime, and all else that the corporate support of art entails. I highly encourage you to go check out the episodes yourself, and if you notice any further connections that I may have missed, be sure to let me know. And now, without further ado, let me try to tie everything together for you. Let me start by recapping everything briefly. The story started out with a young Jonah Whitman, alone and confused, living with his mother and an abusive father. His father beat him regularly, leaving him with scars, both mental and physical. Then something miraculous happened. One night, a show came on TV that would change Jonah's life. Angel Hair. The live broadcast of this show was special. A real angel lived inside of it, one that cared for Jonah and wanted to help him. Gabriel came to Jonah night after night to comfort him, to teach him, to raise him into somebody that his father never would. Most importantly, this angel came to protect Jonah by any means necessary. The details are unclear, but whatever Gabby did for Jonah removed his father from the picture, permanently. It also came at a cost to Jonah, because Gabby had to leave. In the wake of his father's timely ejection from the picture, Jonah's mother began to dig, and she realized that there was something wrong with Angel Hair and Keith Publishing. She stopped her son from watching the show and unknowingly separated him from the most important part of his life. It's okay though, because Jonah's mom had a part to play in this story too. She dug into everything KP was doing behind the scenes 
and built a better life for Jonah. It could have been a happy ending right there, but Jonah's story wasn't over. Many years later, he found a copy of Angel Hair sitting on a shelf in a thrift store, but there was something wrong with it. His friend was gone, and the forest felt dead. After a long investigation, he learned the truth about his past and managed to reconnect with his guardian angel by live-streaming episodes of the show. It was wonderful for a while, but Gabby was slowly eroded by it, being invisibly washed away to the far reaches of the internet. She stopped appearing to Jonah once more, but a new face appeared, Zag Zagel, the dark hair. He never fully trusted Jonah, and Jonah never fully trusted him, but they worked together to save Gabby anyway. Zag wound up letting Jonah in on the fact that the creators of Angel Hair had created another show, Wild Hair. That was where he was from, and it was where they would have to go to locate Gabriel. Jonah agreed and began to live stream the show that Zag Zagel called home. There, Zag used a collection of so-called demon hair boxes to establish a new connection with Gabriel. That's how he and Jonah learned the truth and how Jonah ultimately became the spiritual successor to Wreath of Life. Now, he's working to help Gabriel and Zagzagel reach new children so that they can find the hope and comfort that he once did. I know it seems like a happy ending. Jonah is at peace. Gabby is helping more children than ever before. Francis is tackling his own demons. And Zag, well, he's probably still a grumpy mess, but I don't think there's any changing that. Don't let yourself be fooled. There are still big questions left on the table and how you answer them can change everything. What are Gabriel and Zagzagel? Were they sent to Earth by a perfect god to protect children, or are they agents of the Gnostic Demiurge? Is this the story of a boy and his best friend, or the tale of two demons unleashed upon countless unsuspecting children? At face value, it seems obvious. It really feels like Gabriel and Zagzagel want what's best for Jonah and the world. But... Just for a moment, let's look at the facts. Gabriel's journey with Jonah began during the darkest chapter in his life. At first, she simply supported him, taught him, and encouraged him. It seems innocent enough, but it didn't stay that way forever. Ultimately, there are a few competing theories about the incident with Jonah's father. The show is purposefully vague about what happened, and that's given rise to a few theories. Some believe that Gabby convinced Jonah to kill his own father. Others believe that Jonah's father never died at all and simply disappeared from the family for other reasons. Finally, some believe that Gabriel did the dirty work herself. All three of these theories are at least plausible, but let's look at which one explains the events from the show most completely. Firstly, I think we can pretty easily disregard the idea that nothing bad actually happened to Jonah's father. Jonah's father leaving by his own volition fails to explain any of the events that take place afterwards or Gabby's instructions to Jonah beforehand. Eulila's obsessive investigation into Angel Hair and KP had to be a result of something traumatic involving Jonah, and her focus on anger and aggression implies that some sort of attack or violence occurred. It's still not super clear what happened, but something did happen. Obviously, this implicates Jonah as the perpetrator of whatever happened to his father. Did he use the hidden gun to shoot him? Did Gabby explain to him how to use it? These seem like possibilities, but Remember, Gabby wanted Jonah to be as uninvolved as possible. She created an alibi for him. That tells me that whatever happened, Jonah could have done it. But Gabby was doing everything in her power to prevent that from happening. She never would have made him pull the trigger himself. Finally, while I'm a fan of the idea that Gabby did everything on her own, I think that also ignores some key evidence that we find throughout the series. Primarily, it ignores most of what Jonah says throughout the series. In episode four, he asks an important question. Am I complicit? You can't be complicit in something that didn't happen, and you can't be complicit when you're the one carrying out the crime. Being complicit really only means one thing. Jonah just stood by and let Gabby do it. He let it happen. Here's the issue. That doesn't really explain why Eulila or the police had any suspicions towards Jonah to begin with. After all, he would have been in a friend's house happily playing when it happened. Something had to connect him to the murder. That's why I think that Jonah and Gabriel must have worked together to get the job done. Jonah helped set things up, but Gabby was the one who finally pulled the trigger. In episode five, after Jonah goes back to his childhood home to look into his past, he isn't concerned with finding out about what he did or about what Gabby did. He wants to know what we did. 
I can only conclude that the boy and his angel were in it together. I know there isn't any clear evidence showing that Jonah helped, but we don't see every single second of Jonah's conversations with Gabby. The runtime of all six episodes of Angel Hair is only about 20 minutes, but we know that Jonah would spend hours at a time talking to Gabby. We're left to make guesses about what happened during most of that time, so it's completely possible that the two of them could have spent time planning everything out. With all of that in mind, I think we can conclude that Gabby is a murderer. This pushes her squarely outside of the conception of a biblical angel, but I'm I'm still not entirely sure what to make of that. I mean, she did kill a child abuser in order to protect the one that he was abusing. Does that really count as murder in the strict sense? Hmm. Uh, maybe a quick look at Zagzagel will clear things up. We know much less about Zagzagel than we do about Gabriel for a few reasons. Primarily, it's because of the fact that Jonah doesn't know Zag. He had years of experience talking with Gabby, so he was able to tell us what she was like. We also got three episodes of Letters with Angel Gabby where Francis was telling us all that he could, but only one episode of Inquiries with the Detective. Even then, Francine doesn't tell us too much. She respects Zag's sense of privacy. Finally, that leads us to the biggest thing keeping us from learning about Zag himself. He doesn't want us to know who he is, and he isn't forthcoming with answers about his past. He drops hints here and there, but only when it's beneficial to him. For example, when he asks Jonah if he's with Wreath, we learn that he knows about Wreath of Life, but he doesn't give away any details about his connection to the company. He asks carefully calculated questions designed to get every piece of the puzzle on his side while leaving us with nothing. It's just what you would expect from a detective. We were able to learn a lot about who Gabriel was because she was so open and honest with Jonah during the series. She wanted to be there for him, and that meant letting down her guard. But even if Gabby hadn't been so open, would we have questioned her identity as much as Zagzagel? I don't think so, because of one primary reason. We aren't simply relying on Gabriel to tell us about Gabriel. We already have some idea of her past from another source, the Bible. It'd be kind of crazy to analyze a Christian show about angels without seeing what the Bible actually says about them, so here goes. In the Bible, Gabriel appears four times, twice in the book of Daniel, and once in the book of Luke. In Daniel, both appearances involve Gabriel delivering or interpreting prophecies, which we see in Angel Hair when Gabby gives Francis a dream of her being lost online. Later on in Luke, Gabriel announces the coming of John the Baptist and Jesus. When he does, he introduces himself as Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. This is how we know that Gabriel is so powerful, because being in the presence of God is just supposed to, like, kill you because of how powerful and convicting and awe-inspiring God is. Anyway, the point of all of this is that we know a lot about Gabby's past. Likewise, we should be able to learn about Zagzagel by looking at what the Bible says about him. So, let's dive into it. What exactly does the Bible say about Zagzagel? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I told you there was something wrong. I have scoured everything. Everything I can get my hands on. It's no exaggeration to say that this has taken up at least half my time researching for this video, and there is nothing. The name Zagzagel seems to emerge from thin air during the 1900s with the earliest mention I found being from Gustav Davidson's Dictionary of Angels. Keep in mind that this book, by its nature, can't be the source of the name Zagzagel. Davidson was only attempting to collect, compile, and organize information from other sources, such as the Christian Bible, Jewish and Islamic texts, and sources from modern scholars. The thing is, every time I track down the texts that he's referencing, the name Zagzagel is nowhere to be found. And besides all that, why Zagzagel? Simply from a production standpoint, naming this character anything else would have garnered less suspicion. Why not Michael or heck, even Raphael? After Gabriel, those are the two most commonly accepted biblical angels. There's only one reason that I can see for including Zagzagel of all angels in this series. One other concept that keeps popping up over and over and over again. Gnosticism. Every source 
that I can find referencing Zagzagel has some sort of connection to Gnosticism. Even the Dictionary of Angels itself, even Angel Hair itself, is touched by Gnosticism during the Easter episode. Literally, everything I have ever seen that mentions Zagzagel also deals with devils, demons, the occult, and mysticism. <sighs> but how does all this relate back to Jonah's story and the Zaggy that we know? Well, one of the most key ideas in Gnosticism is the pursuit of understanding and knowledge regarding spiritual mysteries. It doesn't really matter how you get your knowledge, through scripture or experience, or consorting with the occult. Gnosis can be acquired through any means. A far cry from the Christian teaching that understanding comes only from God and that dark spirits are to be avoided at all costs. But what does investigator Zag Wild do? <laughs> Why? He investigates, of course. He gains knowledge. He pursues understanding by any means necessary, even using the so-called demon hair boxes to locate Gabby after her soul had been shattered by Jonah. I would love for someone to pop into the comments to show me how I'm wrong about this. I'd love to know exactly where the name Zagzagel comes from and to dispel all my fears that it's secretly the name of some demon. An unholy apparition. A wolf in sheep's clothing, posing as an angel to lure children into trouble. Even then, <laughs> I recognize that I might just be overthinking it. I mean, what if, what if this is all a coincidence? What if we were never meant to look into things this deeply? No. No, there... There has to be something wrong with this series. Crow. Look, maybe, just maybe, Gabby was good. Maybe her intentions are pure. Maybe she really does love Jonah like a son. But Zagzagel? Even Francis? Even if I can't prove it, they've got to be evil or... Oh, Don't you see it? That's not really fair, Crow. All the emotional posturing, all the kind words and soft voices. It was nothing but a lie. Crow. What? You, you don't, you, you don't really think that, do you? That, that Gabby and, and Saggy and that I'm evil? I don't. Look, I, I get it. New people are scary. You never know what someone is like deep down. But you can't let fear rule you. That's what Gabby taught me anyway. What am I supposed to do about all the evidence then? Everything I see tells me that we shouldn't trust you. Does it? Are you really being honest? Not just with everyone watching, but with yourself? If you aren't, I understand. Believe me, I know honesty is hard. You don't get it. There's always something wrong. That's just how these things work. It can't just be wholesome and happy and everything turns out okay. Can't it? What if, just this once, it all turned out right? Ask yourself a question for me, Crow. What do I actually believe happened? The little fella makes a compelling point. Something deep inside me feels like this has to be an all or nothing approach. Either they're all secretly wicked or they're all, for lack of a better way of putting it, perfect little angels. But it doesn't have to be that way. At the end of the day, despite all the ties to Gnosticism, I don't believe that the world of angel hair was created by the Demiurge. I think that the perfect God of the universe really does love Jonah, and that's been expressed in a very tangible way through Gabriel. That's what I really believe. As for Francis, well, I trust him too. 
Of course, I've got no illusions that he's perfect. At the conclusion of the story, he's still clearly struggling, but he's got good guidance. Gabby cares about him, too. He's in the exact same spot that the Christian worldview says everyone is in. Imperfect, but loved. Finally, there's Zagzagil. Of every character in this show, maybe any show, none has given me so much of a headache as this guy. Everything about him screams that something is wrong, and as much as I want to believe that he's friendly, I still have my doubts. That said, I don't think that he poisons the whole pot. I don't believe that Zagzagel being evil necessarily means that there's a demiurge in control of everything. I don't think that this universe is supposed to hurt, even if it does. I think there's a chance that Zagzagel is meant to be a demon in disguise, but I could also believe that I'm reading too deeply into the details. Maybe at some point we'll see his efforts thwarted, or maybe we'll see him exonerated of all suspicion. Heck, maybe I'm completely wrong and Gabby and Francis really are evil. Maybe I'm the fool for trusting them. Maybe I'm being naive. But that doesn't change the fact that, at the end of the day, I don't personally believe the conclusion that Francis and Gabby are out to get children. As much as it goes against my analog horror analyst instincts, I really do think that we can take most of the series at face value. If you still suspect that something nefarious is going on, that's fine. I definitely think there's a case to be made. But I've done the research, I've looked into everything I could, and watched the series so, so many times. And here, at the end of it all, I can't bring myself to believe that Gabby is a fraud. Or that Francis is... Well, I suppose it's canon that Francis is a liar. Anyway, the point is, I think that for once, the story has a happy ending. Just this one time, in this one particular series, it all turned out right. I'm Cromudgeon. Thanks for watching. packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Cream-colored ponies and crisp apple strudels, doorbells and sleigh bells and schnitzel with noodles, wild geese that fly with the moon on their wings. These are a few of my favorite things. Girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes, snowflakes that stay on my nose and eyelashes, silver white winters that melt into springs, these are a few of my favorite things. When the dog bites, when the bee stings, when I'm feeling sad. I simply remember my favorite things, and then I don't feel so bad.